Hello, everyone. Welcome. Once you connect, feel free to drop your name in the chat, maybe where you're coming in from. If you have anything in particular that really prompted you to join the conversation, you're also welcome to add that into the chat as well, as a way of introducing yourself and giving us a way to connect with you. <clears throat> and we're gonna give another like two minutes or so for people to sort of trickle in. Um, that way we can minimize any sort of, once we get going admin stuff. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, Nicolette. Canada, Nashville, Sweden, UK, Berlin, Colorado, Brooklyn, Chicago, Oakland, Paris, lovely, LA. I love seeing, I know it's like such a typical Zoom thing, but I literally love seeing where people are from. It like makes me so happy. <laughs> Denmark, beautiful. Well, I'll keep monitoring the waiting room and you all are welcome to keep introducing yourself and typing in your reference points for where you're coming in from. Um, and with that, we're going to get started. So today we're talking about erotic ecologies and embodiments, which are for today maps for making and for revelation. And I think we have such a, a beautiful group of panelists and experiences. And I'm particularly very excited because everyone present is also an artist and a dance artist in particular, which for me is actual heaven. And we're going to start the conversation today by just simply letting the panelists briefly introduce themselves as an entry and sort of an entry point into um, how they're coming into this conversation and then we'll get going um, towards the end we'll leave about 15 to 20 ish minutes for questions from you all so if questions do come up. Um, hold them for the question time just um, in case we're not able to monitor the chat closely during the whole conversation. So you'll drop in questions towards the end once we open for that. Um, let's get started. So Anika, would you mind kicking us off by introducing yourself and how you would like us to know you today? Thanks, Mary Grace. Hi all from everywhere around the world. It is really cool to see different locations pop up. Um, my name is Anika Austin and I'm a dancer, performer, choreographer, I'm an archivist in Atlanta, Georgia. My pronouns are she and her. And I do a lot of work um, with ritual and meditation in mind. So a lot of the choreography that I am researching or embodying is very slow, very um, contemplative. And that's kind of the space that I'm coming from when I think about ecology and embodiment. Unmute self. Michael, would you like to um, kick us off next? Sure. Uh, my name is Michael J. Morris. My pronouns are they, them, there. And I am an astrologer, a tarot reader, a dancer, a choreographer, an educator, and facilitator. Um, and I'm currently based in Columbus, Ohio, in the United States, which is the traditional and contemporary lands of the Shawnee, the Potawatomi, the Delaware the Miami, the Peoria, the Seneca, the Wyandotte, the Ojibwe, and the Cherokee peoples. And how am I coming to this conversation? Well, I, have, I hold a PhD in dance studies, and in my doctoral work, I wrote a dissertation on eco-sexualities in performance, really looking at the intersections of performance, embodiment, sexuality, and the more than human world. And my most recent work or more recent work is focusing on uh, movement dancing as a methodology for ritual, magic, witchcraft, and healing. So already some beautiful overlapping with uh, Anika's work. Um, yeah, that's who I am. 
No, kiss just we saved you for last. Would you like to introduce yourself and how you're doing? I thought so. I was like, give you some time. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's um my name is Alka Stistemek, and I'm a dancer and choreographer. And uh, buto is the modality that I'm trained in uh, foremost. I'm also a publisher, and I publish um, occult and esoteric books for practitioners. Um, my work is really concerned with a, a figure and a force um, we call Babylon now, who is um, derived from the, the harlot of revelation. And I'm very interested in my work, both artistically, magically, um, theoretically, with um, sex, sexuality, and eroticism. And so I imagine this is why I'm, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Um, and I live in Cornwall at the very edge of the UK in a place called the Lizard. <laughs> and it's nice being on the edges of things. That's me. Yes, to the edges of things. Uh, I think the first question to sort of lay out a buffet of some of the things that we'll weave as we go is a lot of people, we have a lot of associations with the erotic and, and what the erotic is, um, as well as ideas of ecology, what it means to be in a body. And I think for those of us um, present and pinned, those are all very like intersecting ideas, but um, perhaps to start, we could talk about the the force of the erotic or the uses, the power of the erotic, and what are some of the core components or um, energies that you bring to that idea in that force when you're working with it, when you conceptualize it? And does anyone want to kick us off with that? I'll start. <laughs> Um, for me, uh, the erotic is the, the energy, the force that suffuses all. So even going back to um, Diotima speaking in Timaeus, she sees Eros as the great daimon because it's neither a god nor a human, but it links the world of the, the, the supra to the mundane, to the terrestrial. And I really see the erotic as this Thing that connects us to our environment so it's absolutely intrinsic to any understanding of ecology because it is the relationships we have with all things um, all other living beings but just in relationship to anything that we might be there is this erotic energy either sympathia or antipathia um, and i think in humans that force is always erupting out of us you know even uh, as soon as we're conceived we are already this energy that's striving to exist and to be and to to individuate and to keep going so for me it is this fundamental force that ties us to life but also connects us to all other living beings in, and creates our environment, our ecology. It, it's the energy underlining everything. So I, I, I understand it like that in my work as well. And, and it's absolutely the, the foremost um, place it holds is because of that. And if anyone else wants to <laughs> come in. I guess I'll follow after that. Um, I, I think my view of the erotic is extremely resonant with what Alkistis just um, articulated for us in terms, especially in terms of that which connects all things, um, that which is moving through all things. Um, and then the ways in which the erotic specifically, the ways in which we in, in our forms can access or attenuate to that sense of connection. Um, some of my greatest teachers, I think, on the erotic, um, first and foremost, is uh, Black lesbian feminist poet, writer, warrior, um, Audre Lorde, <clears throat> who wrote in Uses of the Erotic, um, the erotic as power. She described the erotic as the measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. 
Um, she described it as an internal sense of satisfaction, the fullness and depth of feeling, not only a question of what we do, but how fully and acutely we can feel in the doing. And so I think for me, as, I'm, as I work with the erotic, as I think about and write about and move through the erotic, um, there is there's a, a strong emphasis on what, what can we feel? What can we sense? What can we perceive? What more uh, is available to us? How do we exceed um, many of the sort of socially constructed um, ideas and categories and um, parameters that actually uh, foreclose our access to feeling, that depth of fullness um, that we're capable of? And I think for me that um, starts to connect to ecology um, because of the way specifically the category of the human um, forecloses our access to so many of the connections that were actually comprised of, that actually compose us, all of the relations to the more than human that we already are, um, like the air that we are and the fire that we are and the water and earth that we already are, the microbiome of our bodies, all of the ancestors that live in us and through us, both in terms of things like genetic material, like blood ancestors, but also our ancestors of path and possibility, the ways in which my life is an embodiment of all of the queer and trans ancestors who came before and made it possible for me to live, the ways that I practice in ritual, in movement, in dancing, um, the lives that came before me, the witches and the choreographers and the dancers that live through my body because I align with the practices that moved through their bodies. Um, but also in sex, the ways in which sex itself is a kind of choreography, the, sec the, the, the practices that I engage in, um, in queer sexual practices, didn't, I'm not the first one to do them. I didn't create these things, although I do think there's a creative force in the erotic as well, but that um, even in our sexual practices, as we fuck, as we, as we uh, connect to one another's bodies, as we connect to our own bodies, that we're also connecting to this lineage of something like sexual ancestors who um, also moved through the world in these ways. Um, and so that's where the, the erotic reaches out towards the ecological for me, I think, is the, the exceeding these categories, whether those are the category of the human or um, sort of limited and limiting uh, binary gender or sexual categories that say you can only feel this or you can only be this, that the erotic pushes us or propels us into the connections that exceed those categories in some way. That's my, those are my opening thoughts, I think. Okay. I feel really connected with those opening thoughts, Michael, because I think about the erotic as kind of a homing device in a way, and that sense of connecting through time or inserting the erotic and pleasure into our thoughts about liminal space is interesting to me. And the sense of uh, who else, what else, how else has the erotic been experienced in my lineage and how I have all this expansive opportunity within, within me to tap into that. Like I don't have to go very far to access that. It feels uh, like a way of bringing, bringing all of these ladies and entities and, and frogs and groundhogs and turtles into the space at this exact time through our ability to kind of transcend like 1.45 p.m. right now. And I think about the erotic as that kind of like a time traveling grounding device. And that brings me back to home like quite often when I uh, go back to the text or think about how my grandma expressed the erotic through making catnip tea or something like that. So these are all very accessible ways of accessing the erotic in my life and in my practice that resonates with what both of y'all were saying. Yeah, I was thinking how there's so much like paradox, I think in being human and therefore in the erotic as well as like the erotic is this force, which is, it can connect us to everything and therefore we can but it also is something that brings us back 
into our body and it can be both. We can leave our body via the erotic and we can come back into the body and we can know through that in, in a lot of different um, magical and creative ways. And so if the erotic is something that can connect us to everything, therefore we can sort of tap into it for creativity that's beyond um, perhaps our immediate capacity or revelation or knowing that's beyond our immediate capacity. And I know you all have different ways of working with that and also a lot of cross um, intersectional ways of working with that. But your um, experiences and practices or some of your ideas around the erotic as a way of, of knowing um, or an invitation to knowing that is beyond you and also knowing that which is within you. Um, and that is also a creative practice as well. We don't have to pretend like we're not, um, that we're not dancers <laughs> here because we are, whereas the body is a, a huge way of knowing um, because it is the medium um, in that form. Something that, um of what Annika was saying, and you also uh, made me think a couple of nights ago, I, I was sort of freaking out. Oh, what am I going to say? Like, I, I don't know anything about the subject. Like, what am I talking about? What am I doing here? <laughs> but I dream, I had this dream and my grandmother was there. And I remember Annika mentioning about the way the erotic connects with ancestry. And I found this a very direct example of that, that she, she had a message for me just in the way she appeared. She was looking rejuvenated. She was younger and taller and her hair was starting to um, stop being gray, but the color was starting to come through again. She had a message for my sister as well, but it reminded me as soon as I woke up, I connected it to a work I did called The Decolation of Flowers, which um, was a revisioning of the dance of Salome. But I was really wanting to examine a relationship between her mother, Herodias, and Salome, and a way of understanding the how we inherit the erotic from our mothers or from those who raise us, the people who literally we're cradled in their wombs, then we are held in their arms, we, we, we feed from their bodies, and their body is our first awakening to the sensation of being a body in the world, and it's also our first erotic imprinting, the first awakening of those senses which, as we uh, mature, become sexual, become part of our erotic uh, makeup or, or evolution. And so I just had that very strong sense that she was there and she was young and vital again, or, or sort of middle-aged, but becoming stronger. And I felt this chain of ancestry through my mother back to her mother and realized that my manifestation of the erotic, my experience of this realm, which is for me so fascinating because it penetrates the body, but it's also of the imaginal. The thing with the erotic is this, there's no limits to it at all. It is something which um, our imaginations are suffused by, our dreams are suffused by, but also our bodies are literally moved and transformed by. So it, it, it moves through matter and through the imaginal equally, but also through these generations and lost generations, it's coming through and it can always talk to us through, through dreams, through signs and things. And just that sense that my my being in the world my sense of being an erotic being has come through this lineage of those who held me those who who passed on that um haptic or that tactile sensation skin against skin so it ties in a little to what both michael and annika i think were saying and my creative process as well this sense of excavating my own body and my feelings and going deeper into where they've come from and where then I can take them in a work. But yay for grandmothers. <laughs> to the well, rescue as always. <laughs> Something I found so touching about what you just said in terms of the, the lineage of the erotic was um, uh, when you said that we start to we start to get a sense of ourselves as bodies through this contact with mm. with the maternal body um and how we might mm, understand that in a broader way in terms of uh, part of how the erotic functions but also what it means to be a body is mm. like we become a body with and for other bodies and 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 as you said that is both tactile and haptic but also imaginal it's also the um the intangible the the kind of the realm of 
if not fantasy, although including fantasy, um, definitely the 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 real that is not yet actual, or or the way in which we extend beyond the immediate present conditions into some other possibilities. And I think that I mean, especially um, coming from practices in Bhutto, that so much of it is about inscribing and installing this imaginal, mm, we can call it a score or a territory or um, field of possibilities inside of the body. Uh, for, for folks uh, listening, um, Bhutto, I, what's my short explanation of Bhutto for people who don't know? Uh, it's a, I would call it a postmodern Japanese dance form that emerged primarily in the work of Tatsumi Hishikata and Kazuo Ono in Japan in the mid 20th century. And a lot of the methodology, although not exclusively, there's been a lot of innovation and variation in terms of what Bhutto has become as it has migrated around the world. Um, but the, the Bhutto that I've practiced most is um, dance that emerges from this inscription or installation of images within the body that then surface through the physical form in some way. Um, and so there's this very, um, intentional relationship to the imaginal and the ways that the the the, the imagination um, connects us to more of what our body can be and become so that as we as we place these images in relationship to the body the body then actually becomes something else and that's the part that I'm connecting back to this idea of the the infant connecting to the maternal body that we in some way become a body through how we connect um, whether those connections are physical and tactile with a mother or then later in life a lover, or that connection is through the imagistic work, the fantasy life that, that we might bring into our artistic practices, our creative practices like Bhutto, um, but also in terms of like, I think of that in terms of um, tantric yoga practices and the, the installation of the chakras in, inside the body and the ways that also shifts the, the subtle energetic physical body in our relationship to these to these inscriptions or these installations of ideas inside of our bodies. And, and then of course that's true in sexuality as well, that even, um, I mean, not to go too far into the psychoanalytic, but like every time that we're engaging with a body, we're also engaging with our own projections of fantasy and our own, the kind of phantasmatic quality of, of um, any sort of sexual interaction is like, is never, only um, the person who's in front of us or with us or touching us or inside of us or who we are inside or whatever, but that it's all we bring to all the significance, all the signification and fantasy and, and meaning that we bring to that encounter as well. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to like swim in those waters with you in terms of the like the, the, the erotic as the connection between the body and another body, an image, an idea, a fantasy that, and this is maybe the point I'm trying to get to, that uh, substantially changes the body itself. We become a different kind of body through these connections. We become more of our bodies. And that was even something that Mary Grace was gesturing to um, in response to something Anika said in terms of the, the reaching outward, but also the coming back home to the body and it's like almost another way we could think about that is the reaching out to another home body and like where where else is this body and where and how might that also be home for us in some way yeah i'll pause take a breath there that all feels so rich and kind of, again, I'm going to talk about time because that's just where my head is and that I feel like that's coming out in the other responses that because movement is dynamic idea, like it's dynamic idea and thought, the next thing, the thing that comes after a movement is, is completely open to any possibility. So it makes me think of like, being able to make decisions about the future through movement and that kind of imagining also happens looking back into the past and and how ritualized gesture in a lot of ways was in efforts to bring us back to this mythological beginning or this cosmogony of a of a place and a people going to a specific location and doing a specific gesture is bringing us back to 
like the birthing of a universe and that sets us back to a specific time and and in a lot of ways creates uh i guess kind of this whole idea of the profane and the mythic like we're just living our lives going to work and you know uh, milking the cows and whatnot and every year on january 1st we come together and decide that actually our mayor defeated the dragon such and such multiple heads and we are so much more than these people who milk cows and not, i think that that's it's not necessarily separating ourselves from our humanity but it is kind of like uh what i think mary grace talks about sometimes just this mythologizing of our everyday lives and and creating the story and this beauty that is necessary for us to survive and thrive and i i think that that is what this base the, the base conversation about the erotic is that uh the erotic as an, an impulse is dynamic movement that's informing a future that is a world that we may not have been able to imagine in the moment, but is creating itself through all of these gestures of sensuality and, and being present in the moment. So that, yeah, that's what, that's what came up from uh, how you're bringing up time, Michael, and or, or how I just inserted time into what you said because I want to talk about it, <laughs> but yeah. No, I think time was absolutely implicit in what I was saying, and I'm so glad you brought it forward in that way, um, because I I think that um, intrinsic to my understanding of the erotic is exactly what you said in terms of um, the the moving towards another possibility. So that 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 part of what the erotic does is set things into motion, it, or maybe it is itself a movement that we kind of like slip into the stream of and and move with it and it carries us someplace someplace else in some sense and there's a temporal quality to that there's a, a tem temporal spatial quality to that there's probably like a sort of ethics to that as well of in terms of the what does it mean to uh to move towards an elsewhere um that there's there's a kind of in implicit critique of our current conditions inside of that perhaps maybe um that and i'm thinking there about like the ways in which um, folks like Alexis Pauline Gums have written about the idea of fugitivity and the ways in which fugitivity is always a, go, a moving towards elsewhere, um, a living into the possibilities of a, of a future yet to come, um, and, the way, and the ways in which doing so brings those possibilities into the present in an embodied way, which I think is something that we're doing always as we operate through the erotic and then also as artists in that kind of creative process of um, reaching towards something that is yet to come, but as we do so, we're actually embodying it in the present. So there's absolutely this kind of temporal um, uh, cycle or, or loop that's happening, I think, inside of what we're talking about. Oh, yes. that's so true. I, whenever I'm trying to talk, like tell, <laughs> to like try to talk to someone about creative process, I'm like, it always just feels like a crater or like a meteor just like coming towards me. And then it just like merges with you. And, and then it like comes through. And that is, um, and I just was thinking of that when you were speaking about that relation to time and so many things about, you know, thinking of when, the erotic as this it's thinking of as like the pulse and the desire for the pulse at the same time and the way that everything desires life um, or the desire for life, um, not necessarily as the antithesis of death, but life as the thing that holds all of it. And when you were talking about, I don't remember who it was now, but yeah, this way that we, we come back to ourselves, but also find home in other bodies and not thinking of that within an ecological sense of like also within our environment or the earth and um, interspecies relationships as also that where, where we find home in the weather, in the elements, in the place where we are. Um, and thinking of the erotic is also like finding home in those places and also merging in that and whether we're talking about shape shifting specifically but or not but thinking about even how we used to um, 
what Anika was pointing to, these regular rituals where we would like put on the skins and the antlers of animals, right? And like be who they are and let them like dance through us and make love through us and like feel what it is to be alive in that way. And to me, that is a very deeply like ecological um, or very obvious example of this like ecological erotica of how we belong to one another um, and we all desire to be alive. Um, and that's not a question, but it's a prompt. So whoever wants to pick that up can go. I think this um, definitely what you're speaking about is pointing to this quality that the erotic has, which is that it shatters our personal boundaries in some way. It transforms us by taking our habitual boundaries far beyond where we're usually comfortable so like obviously sex is the most like one of the most sort of sh um, shocking or, or intimate examples of this but I think even in making art and I think particularly with performance you have this um, the erotic energy of performance is also one in which you connect both with the earth and with the audience through your body being there in space together and through the gaze. And I don't just mean like the gaze of the audience that you, but you're looking back at them. And the way I work is very much to do with um, bringing something through from beyond. So using that erotic energy to allow for a force or a, a phantasm, a ghost, <laughs> a phantasm is the word I prefer to use, to inhabit me and to, to um, in the way that Michael was explaining about uh, images within the body in Bhutto. So holding this phantasm and its phantasmic realm or, or landscape within me, and that being something I share with the audience, and their attention coming back to me too. So it's a two-way thing. There's, a, there's a, a resonance and a dynamic that's set up there, which is very much within the realm of the erotic in that um, there are multiple energies mixing. It's um, not exact, well, yes, it's kind of, uh, how would you say? We all, we all share in this moment and that's what creates it as something potentially sacred, something that goes beyond anything individual. And the artist is, I think that that particular role goes back to the origins of art or the origins of performance. Um, again, when Annika is talking about that we are more than, you know, the people that milk the cows or whatever, there's a time when we connect to our past, to our ancestry, to where we've come from, to to our cosmologies, our stories, and we, we live them and we act them out and the ancestors move through us as well. So I find that the, the erotic suffuses that performance state and, and the creation of art, which is leading up to that like high point, which you share. So that's kind of where it brought me, <laughs> where it's going. <laughs> I don't know if any more thoughts about the, the performance aspects of the erotic. Mm. as we're all choreographers and dancers <laughs> yes. that, I'm glad you're bringing it back to that too because I kind of I forget being in a kind of scholarly mode sometimes in my head but uh, lately or with some work that I've been doing object is important as an extension of embodied ritual so things that you have in your home that are not necessarily spectacular, but have something based on how you use them is important and interesting to me in that there's this kind of idea, or not idea, but there's this feeling that this uh, cup is a mundane object that is just being used for the purpose of giving me water right now or whatever, but it, but it may have more purpose for you than it does for another person who's looking at that cup. And I think that bringing those objects into performance space kind of creates this extraordinary object because you're creating a sacred space, like you're saying, Alkistus around it. And 
then we recognize that the cup is more than a, a mundane object. It it gives you, it sustains you if you're thirsty, but it also might have been given to you by your grandma. I mean, we have no idea what, what goes on with this cup and its history. So some of the, uh, I guess, purpose or why of creating for me at this moment is acknowledging how Black women particularly have imbued beauty so much into functional objects that it didn't necessarily need to be beautiful. And for some reason, these particular curtains that I have to use for this quilt right now are going to be lined up in this particular way because I want to look at this quilt like this. And it also brings me heat and you know comfort in ways that are necessary for survival. And that to me like is what comes up when you're talking about creating sacred space through performance and ritual because that to me is necessary and it's 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 an everyday necessity that i consider like not an option of a thing to do and and to me that is also again the erotic like it's not an option it's quote unquote poetry is not a luxury <laughs> you know these, <laughs> these things are i i think that that's what performance is to me in a way it's it's making sacred the mundane in a way. Mm. I think we live in such a rich culture materially in the West that we take so many things for granted, which you see in so many parts of the world, like a cup is, is literally like maybe someone's only possession or <laughs> something, and it has um, so much value. But what you're making me think as well is that there's survival, there's the way we just like sustain life, but culture comes out of this extra that the erotic brings. So that erotic energy is our more than. Our, we are no longer tired after a day of working. We still have time to create a blanket, to, to create some clothes or make a cup or pottery or something, to, to create the world around us. And that's out of that erotic energy that there's always so much surplus of. It's just this sort of life force that keeps erupting out of us and it doesn't have to manifest as performance or high art but just the the world we create around us the homes we make the these artifacts that we have every day with us are outpourings of this energy and particularly in I think particularly in a nurturing way these become the things that connect us to our families, to our histories, to our cultures in very, very strong and deep ways that is very hard to express except that you feel it in your body. So that's what's, yeah, that's what your words have sort of prompted in me, that sense of how the erotic spills into everyday life all the time. Mm. I am so inspired by all of you. Um, <laughs> I, I want to I want to tra track or trace a couple of ideas that and reflect back back things that I heard and then add to some of those things. Um, first, there's like there's this kind of growing um, constellation of connections that we each explore in our artistic practices. So Anika talking about the object and the mundane and making it sacred and the way that we relate to it and the way that it connects us not only to the object itself in that are all around us, but also to the lineages and the others who held and gathered and imbued beauty into the everyday through such objects. So that, that's a kind of, there's a cluster of connections there. Um, and Alkistus talking about the drawing in or bringing through something from elsewhere, from beyond in the, in the form of the phantasm or the spirit or the daimon or the goddess that comes through in the performance in the, and so there's a connection there of like the bringing something through from beyond. And I'm thinking about um, the ways in which my own performance practice, my own work in, in dancing and ritual and buto and, and movement and all kinds of things um, relates to connecting to, I guess I would articulate it as connecting to the more that Alkistus was just gesturing to the, like it's more than the, the mundane or the everyday or the, um, our conventional ways of thinking about ourselves or understanding ourselves. 
Um, and for me, it's about connecting to the more that we already are. And so a lot of my work in the last, like, I don't know, five, five, let's say five years, six years, something like that has been about connecting to the more than human that I already am. So how do I move? Not like water, but as water. I am water. <laughs> There's water. This body is water. This body is earth. This body is air and fire. How do I move as those parts of myself as a way of connecting to more that I am, but also getting beyond the limits of what we think of as the human and all of the um, politics and uh, repression and oppression that comes with being a human? How does, would, not to say that we can just like, slough it off and it'd be done with it, but how do we reach beyond it for something else to bring that world into the present? And I think that also shows up in terms of our, oh, and I, that connects back to the idea that Alkista said in terms of the, the, the shattering of the ego, the shattering of the self in some way. It's like, I can no longer be the self that I am in my everyday life when I am moving as water and fire and earth and air. I can no longer simply be who I am on this Zoom call when I am shaking for an hour as the, the quaking earth beneath my feet. It's like something in a very tangible way is getting shattered, is getting broken down, not only as an act of destruction, but also as an act of creation. Something emerges from that debris, from all of the, the, the remnants and the traces and um, what can then come through in that breaking down. But then I think of that also in terms of sex, in terms of the ways that, um, again, not to limit the erotic to sex, but also not to exclude sex from the erotic, which I think is actually I literally said this in an astrology consultation yesterday. I think so often there's an effort to um, expand what the erotic can be beyond the sexual, that it almost drifts into a kind of sex negative place of like ex then excluding sex and sexuality. And I think we absolutely need to keep sex and the sexual and sexuality in, which I think we all are in this conversation, um, inside of our conception of the erotic, um, because we're still living in a very sex negative culture. Um, but inside of sex, I mean, this is stuff that I think about and talk about a lot in terms of eco-sexuality, that in sex already, we're in these sorts of uh, Mm, multi-species affairs that like in the in the mundane space of our body you're already a vast ecosystem you're already a microbiome you're already thousands of species of bacteria and fungi and protists and protozoans and um mitochondria inside of ourselves like already every sexual experience you've ever had even with if it's just yourself is already a vast erotic collective involved in that. And then if we bring in the, the sort of the invisible, the, uh, what Alkistus often describes, or I've heard Alkistus describe as the occulted body, all that we can't see that is also the body. And for me, that includes things like the ancestors of blood and path and possibility, and that in every sexual encounter, they are present as well. That is also part of the erotic encounter. But then I also think about the ways in which our sexual practices are already deeply entangled with ecosystems beyond what we might think of as our body in a way that actually expands or extends or stretches the reach of what we think of as a body. And that's like very, can be very practical. So like, um, I often talk about things like if you use any sort of uh, safer sex protection barrier, whether that's like dental dams or gloves or finger cuts or condoms or whatever that is, probably you discard that at some point and that ends up in a landfill somewhere, which is a very kind of practical way in which our sexual, uh, sexual practices have implications for ecosystems elsewhere, for more than human life. Um, I also think about the ways in which birth control pharmaceuticals are at this point the most prevalent man-made molecule in water supplies, in waterways, um, without any sort of like moralizing of that. Um, but now there's species that are evolving and adapting and um, mutating because of the density of hormones that are now in waterways. Um, and so then there's this direct connection between what we often describe as the sexual revolution and the liberation of sexuality that comes with birth control and the implications that holds for other species. That it's not just human life that's pushed into something new, a new possibility because of birth control pharmaceuticals. Now other species are also being pushed into other possibilities as well. Um, and then maybe the last thing I'll, I'll say in terms of the way the entanglement of, the se of sexual practice with the more than human world, 
um, is the prevalence of, of things like um, video pornography or um, sex toys that are either vibrators that are either electric or battery powered. Let's for the moment, let's focus on the electric and the ways in which every time you um, arouse yourself or climax in, in relation to video pornography or with an electric vibrator, your orgasms have an immediate direct and, and indirect relationship to energy industries, to coal mining, to wind farms, to the generation of electricity so that you can watch your videos or I can watch my videos or whatever. There, again, there's no morality, no moralizing here, but just tracing some of the connections of the ways in which even what we think of as our purely human sexual practices with our human selves and our human partners are already vastly entangled with the more than human world. And that is also a kind of shattering of a sense of self that it's not just me here fucking, it's not just me and you here together, that already we are, these actions propelled by our own erotic desires, our impulses, our excitations, our arousal is already reaching out to more than human life, even in, the, in that moment. And that, so, so the, the two things that I'm trying to trace there is this kind of shattering of the self with the erotic, and then also the um, adding to this constellation of relations that we're creating through our sexual practices and through our artistic practices, through our dance practices. Quite a few things I wanted to respond to there, if I can remember them. Um... You reminded, you made me think of the libidinal ecology and um, like Klosowski's living currency, this understanding that underlying all economies are bodies, um, usually the woman's body or the young girl as the sort of the, the, the unit of um, flow between people and things. But then we are also thinking of a libidinal ecology as well, one in which our erotic flows shape our environment and ourselves within the environment, because that's inescapable. And the way I understand eros and the erotic energy is not as a good thing or as a bad thing. I don't have any moral um, take on it. I just see it as a pure force and absolute energy, the strongest energy, and one that we have to individually and as cultures um, negotiate our relationship with. And that's something that's always in negotiation, always being fought out between people, between ourselves. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 when you mentioned pornography, I thought that was very interesting because and, and also the, the sort of like sex toys and everything, because what's sort of happening is that these intensities in us, our erotic intensities are also being stimulated by the new technologies that we're living with. So electricity, yes, but we are already electrical beings, but also in terms of our, the accessibility of pornography, which was never as accessible as it is now. So it's literally transforming us. And I think one of the things that you see with pornography is that it can create such intense experiences that it can volatilize everything we are and transform us like it quite rapidly transform us into something else either good or bad it depends it depends on the individual it depends on other forces um, within the environment but i think that it's created a, a much stronger energy in terms of what we can do. And so with that goes a greater responsibility. And I just wanted to sort of bring that idea of we have access to more power because, of course, this stimulates even more the libidinal energies. And also it's more democratic in that we have, it's not just some elite that have access to the free time and the sex toys and, <laughs> and the imagination, this, these realms, but um, many, 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 many more people through the internet, through new technologies, through the way work is now, through the amount of, we have liberated ourselves from, uh, at least in the West, and most of us from the kind of toil that for so much of our evolution, we would have had to be tied to. And I mean, like, uh, since agriculture, because uh, hunter, gar uh, gardener, gatherers have quite a different sort of 
um, relationship with time anyway, but the sort of agricultural relationship and this tying of the body to, to the toiling of the earth. So I'm very interested in how we might, how this is going to develop. It's one of my understandings of how, where the body is going as well, like our bodies. And I think partly pornography, partly this libidinization of our um, ecologies is one of the most, the strongest factors in where we take things. And as artists, we also have very much a responsibility because our visions often become materialized later. So we are also at that. Um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it there and see if anybody else wants to jump in and take this further, but just my immediate response to what you were saying, Michael. Mm. Can I say one fast thing and then I'll sink back into the, <laughs> a little bit. Um, you were saying in, uh, that the, this libidinalization that comes with and the intensification that comes with pornography to different effects, depending on the person and circumstances. And even as you said, that, it's like, and depending on the pornography, that there's quite mm -hmm. a lot of different pornography out there and, um, and quite a lot to be um, critiqued, I think, in a lot of mainstream pornography, um, which is why I, I am kind of constantly championing and and putting forward the the work of the feminist porn movement that really started in the 1980s and continues today. But people who are even as you said that we as artists have a responsibility because what we imagine or what we reach for comes into the world in some way. And I think that's true for pornographers as well, for uh, porn directors, porn performers, um, that, that what they're creating, what they're producing, what can then get circulated in the world also produces a series of effects. And um, I think that there's um, so much work that has been done is st and still to be done um, from the perspective of feminist pornography, which is not inherently heterosexual, queer, or otherwise, but it's more like an ethos or an ethics around what is it that we're doing as porn makers? Um, yeah, and that that and that and will that opens up a very different kind of trajectory in terms of where we move this power, this libidinal power that, that gets activated. I really appreciate the conversation around this because I, well, I know much less about Go eco sexuality and libidinal ecologies and things. And I'm so excited to even hear those words. I think what comes to mind for me, just with without that experience or language, is uh, I just read, I forgot the author's name, but the the article is something like uses of the erotic eco-critical views of literature or something like that. Anyway, the author mentions a few books and, and books of poetry and prose that are, um, I guess, kind of speaking about the earth as body and our sexual relationship with the earth itself or land or like nature, trees, grass as body and our ability to be in sexual relationship with the earth and in, in, in the sense of um, experiencing sensual and maybe like revelatory moments with our acknowledgement of like the vibration of the earth or the dryness of the desert or the moistness of mud or 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 any of those things. And I think that uh, it was really complicated reading for me in that I I wrote to Mary Grace about this actually in a letter about the body as as about the earth as gendered body because it's so interesting. Like if you're if you're going to give the earth this body, then there's all these complications politically, socially, culturally around the gender and sex and like how the mountains are mounds of such and such, you know, like the, in, in literature from like mostly white male, like people who like to take pilgrim, pilgrimages across the country, they're describing mountains as, you know, the hips or curves of a woman. And this is beautiful to me. So I'm not saying that, that that it's not right or whatever. I'm not putting a judgment on it. I, I'm saying that 
what am I saying? I think that it's beautiful to <laughs> relate the earth to the body. And I'm interested in how y'all are thinking or how people are thinking about how we negotiate the earth as body or land as body or the ecological body and negotiate gender and sexuality with those concepts. And, you know, yeah, that's kind of like a question or just an interest. I respond to two things. Oh, go ahead, Alkistis. No, 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 you, you. <laughs> well, uh, uh, the two things, oh, just the, 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 the politics of, of attributing a certain kind of body to the earth, a gendered body or a sexual body, um, as well as the, 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 ex the examples you gave of the body being in like the dryness of the desert or the, the moistness of the soil or the intensity of the winds or the, the waters and things. Um, and with that, that, that idea of, I love those examples of the kind of the situatedness of the body in a particular place in relation to a particular part of the earth, kind of the earth and what, and gesturing back to things we were talking about earlier, what kind of body it calls forth. We become a different kind of body in the dryness of the desert. We become a different kind of body in the cool moistness of the night under the stars, for example. And um, what kind of body gets called forth by where we are actually reveals that the body and where it is are not separate. That these are this is a this is a kind of false dichotomy between like the division of the self and, and the quote unquote environment. But in fact, we're always in this co-constitution with place in that sense. And then in terms of the gendering of the of the earth, um, I'll just gesture. I've been saying this a lot lately on, on thing um, because it always feels too big to articulate it. So I just gesture towards it um, that there's been so much writing and activism and um, and artistic uh, um, expressions or articulations in what gets broadly defined or described as ecofeminism, queer ecofeminism, and eco womanism um, that really emerged from the 1970s forward um, out of feminist literatures critiquing the feminization of the earth as a basically a method of domination that whenever we um, whenever these kind of casual uh, correlations between the body of female assigned people or women and the body of the earth when we make these equations we can't deny the fact that historically um, especially in western patri heteropatriarchal um, civilization the relationship to both of these kinds of bodies has been one of domination, extraction, and exploitation. So then what are we doing when we feminize the earth or otherwise? Um, and there's actually a great film by um, ecosexual artists, Annie Sprinkle and Beth Stevens. They've done a, a couple of, of really exceptional ecosexual films. One's called Goodbye Golly Mountain, an ecosexual love story about mountaintop removal um, in West Virginia. And then the second one is called Water Makes Us Wet, Haha. <laughs> um, and in Water Makes Us Wet, there is a um, there are voiceovers of the voice of the earth. And they cast the voice of the earth um, as Sandy Stone. The person doing the voice is Sandy Stone, who was maybe the progenitor of transgender studies. She was one of the first trans people in academia to write about trans experiences. Up until that point, um, trans experiences had been written about by predominantly straight, white, cisgender uh, medical physicians and psychologists. And so there was this real moment in the late 80s, early 90s when trans folks started writing about their own experiences. And Sandy Stone really set the stage for the emergence of, tra of transgender studies. And so she does the voice of the earth, with pro which prompts this very interesting contemplation of what if the earth is trans and what do we mean by that? What does, if we're going to gender the earth, what does gendering the earth as trans do for us conceptually in the same way that we might ask questions about what does the feminization of the earth? And of course, those things aren't exclusive. The feminization of the earth and the transing of the earth uh, might be simultaneous and, and both lead us to kind of productive um, understandings of how we're relating to, to place and land and, um, planet, I think. Alkistis, you were starting to say something before oh. I jumped on that. <laughs> Nothing as erudite as that. I was just going to comment on um, when Annika mentioned mountains and how they were described, it just made me think immediately of, I've been interacting a lot with the work of Lou Andrea Salome, who um, wrote 
a short, very interesting little book called The Erotic. But um, in, in a letter to Freud, she knew um, Nietzsche, Freud, uh, so she was a very important woman um, at the turn of the century and the early parts of the 20th century. But she just described the female, because she was also engaged very much with these questions of um, sex and gender roles and so on at that time. But um, she just described the female, like the sexual organs of the woman as being like all the jewels, all the precious stones inside a mountain. So they're all hidden up there, but it's like we're filled with these precious stones. And I, I just, the mountain thing made me think of that. So that was all and this kind of sense again of like bodies having these treasures in them, just like the earth has treasures in them without even going into sort of what sex something is or what, how you might gender it to just those just the pure abundance and, and beauty of this connection between our bodies and the earth. And that counts whatever sex we are and however we decide to present to the world or whatever. But yeah, I'm, uh, that, was, <laughs> that was all I was going to say. So <laughs> taking it back to mountains. <laughs> But I love that because what a beautiful uh, butofu that would be to work with the body full of gemstones mm. hidden within the mountains. Like, ugh, yeah. what a gorgeous and starting again, place. Um, back to this alchemical idea that we have all of this within the body. Um, one of my teachers, Komo Rabushi, often uh, he was for a while training as a, a mountain monk, the uh, Yamabushi in Japan. Uh, he spent about a year or 18 months with them when he was a student. But he was very interested in the idea of the mountains as the place where the metals flow down to like the people down in the valleys through the rivers and things. So you have this ecology where the, the metals and the, the stones from the mountains flow down through the streams and, and, and are collected by people and then worked with. But the body is also like this. It has all these potentials, these ores and, and veins of, of metal running through it and gemstones within it. And we, we really have the opportunity with this sort of erotic force to work with that. That erotic fire is part of how we um, turn it into something and, and don't just do, you know, do nothing with it. So um, that's kind of why the, the sort of mountain alchemical interior image is very interesting to me for that connection with alchemy and transformation that's it <laughs> I think that I was thinking when we were talking about the body and like thinking of a multifaceted body which is sort of how I when I think of myself sometimes I just think of these layers like maybe this layer of me uh is more femme and this layer of me is actually like Victorian queer and this um, version of me, you know, I think of myself as having all these different different bodies bring different bodies or different of those layers of us forward. And um, like Ursula Le Guin's character uh, had um, in one of her stories, it's like uh, when they go into Kimmer, which is like the time of the month where they have sex, like the which body they develop depends on the body that they're with. Um, and I was thinking of that when we were talking about like the earth or our kind of, um, erotic relationships in depending on the environments or the ecologies that we're in and think this idea of the extra like what comes forth from us um beyond the mundane um thinking about something that Michael and I actually talked about on a podcast like I don't remember uh a while ago but this idea of survival is pleasurable like bringing the pleasure into survival and like um, a question that I sit with a lot in in either my work or rehearsal or just in life is like what do you touch how do you touch it? And what does it mean that you touch it? And that like shattering or that alchemy that we bring, it's like, if I am the water and I merge with the water and then I bring the water with me everywhere I go, how does the water change where I am? And how are we ourselves like media or vehicles for um, how that change happens, which is our magic, our art, our dance and how we're touching the cup. And I think the last question I'll bring forth before we move to audience questions is, you know, with the, we've touched a little bit on this idea of like technology and I don't mean it as a technological question only, but basically if we're thinking, looking at um, 
this snapshot in this layer of time and what the erotic is pharmacon for and what is what does the erotic bring for us now and whether that is through our art practice or you know how do we know something it's like is it i know it by dancing i know it by writing about it the um i know it like or like the whore like i know it by making love to it and so what is the erotic bringing um yeah i guess to this moment of now as a pharmacon i think is my question. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, <laughs> um, I don't know, let's see. <laughs> you say pharmacon, and I like this word because it's the word that they use in Revelation, that um, it's the in the cup that the harlot holds it's filled with uh, like the cup of abominations it's a kind of medicine so it's poison and medicine and it's to do obviously with the, the sort of the paracelsian sense the uh, understanding that the quantity is the thing that differentiates whether it's a, a medicine or a poison um i again and i think the erotic has the same double face that it is something which is both potentially very dangerous potentially very very transformative and positive so i think that, that the erotic brings that potential to be the thing which lifts you into the next um evolutionary phase or your the next um, work you know the next thing you produce the the next encounter that's meaningful in your life it's propelled by this erotic energy or everything goes wrong <laughs> we all die <laughs> something like that you know i i have a very ambiguous relation i i and i'm fascinated by sort of dark eros as well and the, the power in that that it's something which has this this face um because i was the erotic was for me i was first awakened to it by reading henry miller and then discovering like the Marquis de Sade and this kind of this uh, like anti-literature of weird sex and eros and so I'm very I'm fascinated by that because my own upbringing as well is sort of as a Catholic which necessarily put so many kinks in your psyche that you have to work through when you're like trying to function in the world so the medicine is for me that that double-edged sword that it could go both ways. And I like that danger about it. <laughs> I think something quite similar when you posed that question, Mary Grace, and that the first thing that I thought of was that the erotic is, what, what does it bring is, it brings uh, liberation um, that um, it makes me think again of Audre Lorde and at the beginning of her essay, Uses of the Erotic, the Eroticist Power, she says, in order to, uh, uh, quote, in order to perpetuate itself, every oppression must corrupt or distort those various sources of power within the culture of the oppressed that can provide energy for change. For women, this has meant a suppression of the erotic as a considered source of power and information within our lives. We have been taught to suspect this resource, vilified, abused, and devalued within Western society." End quote. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason that there's a tactic of systems of oppression, whether those are um, gender depressions, racialized depressions, um, oppressions based on sexual practices, sexual minorities, sexual um, um, excesses, whatever the, the that oppression system of oppression is oriented to toward, there's a there's a, a strategy to suppressing and repressing the erotic in particular because it provides energy that is necessary for change, and a system that holds power necessarily wants to reproduce itself in the same way, wants to continue to hold power. So anything that would produce change needs to be um, suppressed or repressed in some way. Um, and so the threat of the erotic, I think, is that it has the potential to liberate us. It has the potential to be a force towards change that goes beyond these current systems of oppression through which we're um, laboring, through which we're living. 
And that is simul and this connects back to what Alkistus was saying of the double edge is it's simultaneously creative and destructive that something is made, but something is demolished, something is destroyed in that movement, in that change, in that process. Um, and I think that as we engage in practices like dance, like other forms of movement practice, really sort of any practice that sensitizes us and attenuates us to that immense resource inside of us, um, the more capable we are of bringing that forward. And uh, yeah, a, a similar kind of like, I have a fascination with it. There's maybe like an edge of fear that like, as you do that, be, be prepared. Your things in your life might uh, be destroyed. <laughs> things that you, ways of thinking about yourself, ways of relating to yourself, ways of relating to others, ways in which you thought the world had to be or roles that you thought you had to inhabit. The more we tap into this depth and fullness of feeling um, that we're capable of, that exceeds the human, that exceeds any of our sort of like binary sexual gender designations, those things become threatened. Those things might even be broken down. Those things might even be um, destroyed, but in the process of bringing forward something new. And that's what I'm broadly summarizing in the term liberation. Something, uh, something gets liberated. And in the process, there are things that will be destroyed. And I think that's the, that's the um, medicine and poison of the erotic. Those, all of that was beautifully said. I, I feel like to add to that, just the bit that I have to add, I think about sometimes my relationship to the wall to my left and the wall to my right or the ceiling or the floor or the door, like everybody look to see what exit is closest to you, that sort of thing and place myself somewhere in order to deal with anxiety or, or depression or whatever is going on with me in, in the moment, if that is, or just to place myself and be excited about four walls around me. And I, I mean, without talking about the, uh, the, the elements of danger and, uh, impulse, for example, because when I danced with a company a while ago, I think th there was so much impulse, so much uh, negation of social norm that was incredibly lovely and also dangerous in a way to my relationships and to myself and just my understanding of who I was. But it was a moment in time that was necessary, and I believe in that. And in terms of something happening for a season and, and gaining some information and moving on to the next thing. So I, I do think that just like in the beginning, we talked about homing, I believe strongly in using the senses as a, as a way of making place and of being because there are so many institutional barriers to fulfillment in many different ways that we could talk about for longer than this. Um, and so one of the tools that we have is to place ourselves or to transform ourselves or to recognize the erotic in other people and their capacity for, you know, connecting to their senses and their deep knowing. I think that uh, it's really special to have this conversation and just to be reminded of it because even being in a panel or even like a Zoom room, having a conversation about it is going to have its own ripple effects. So I think that that's the medicine. And, you know, once you spread that to other people and you can kind of get together every once in a while and give each other the wink of like, this is what I'm doing today, you know, that just keeps on reinforcing what's going on. Because we do need that. I need that reminder every day and, and it excites me to be in spaces that people create in order to cultivate that relationship with other people and to remind ourselves of this capacity that we have, this like magic that I think that, you know, we don't have to think of it that way or we do, 
and and there's so much to that. So yeah, that's what I have to say about the medicine of it. It's every day it's available to you at any at any time. And I think that's so valuable. We're gonna um, open up now for a couple of questions from those of you who are here. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and drop it in the chat because this is not a six hour talk. We won't be able to get to all of them even though we would love to. Um, so I'm happy to send the chat um, with the replay. Um, as well, so people can contemplate them and think about them for themselves. Um, but yeah, if you have a question, drop it in the chat, and then we'll um, we'll pick a couple of them and go from there. Um, where does asexual beings or even separately trauma exist within the erotic? Would the sensuous be the guiding spirit there for those who have a disconnect from their sexual bodies or from these aspects through oppression and all the other elements that disconnect us from? The elementals. So it seems to be a question about the the idea, not the idea, the experience of trauma and or asexuality or a sense of being feeling removed from the erotic. And Nicolette, if that's not a correct assessment of what you're bringing forward, please let me know. Um, I have somatic ideas about that, but I am not a primary panelist. So I'm interested and open to other people's responses and approaches from that or how those topics talk to one another. Well, can I read another passage from Audre Lorde as a response to that? Because I think that she gives us some ways of, of thinking of what else, if not the sexual, if the sexual is a site of trauma or if, um, or if there are other reasons for which the sexual is not a primary way in which someone un understands himself. Um, so Audre Lorde writes in that essay again, um, the erotic functions for me in several ways. And the first is in providing the power which comes from sharing deeply any pursuit with another person. The sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual forms a bridge between the sharers, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them and lessens the threat of their difference. Another important way in which we connect in which the erotic connection functions is the open and fearless underlining of my capacity for joy in the way my body stretches to music and opens in response, hearkening to its deepest rhythms. So every level upon which I sense also opens to the erotically satisfying experience, whether it is dancing, building a bookcase, writing a poem, examining an idea." End quote. There's more there, but what I love that she gestures towards there, especially at the end, is like it's it's part of what I just I, I quoted earlier that it's not about what we do, it's about how deeply and fully we can feel in the doing. So it's not so it doesn't have to be about uh, masturbation or or having sex with another person. It, whatever you're doing, how deeply and fully can you feel yourself in the doing? And of course in terms of trauma, so much of the way trauma works is to shut down our capacities to feel. So then I would say, what's the path? Um, I think in part of the question is the sensual part of the path. I think it's in the learning to feel into the subtleties and the nuances of whatever it is you're doing, whether it's building a bookcase or dancing or writing a poem or examining an idea or going for a walk and being in connection with place and feeling into more. I think that is profoundly erotic. I agree with what Michael just said. <laughs> I think that the erotic is the thing that it doesn't have to be expressed sexually, but it's the thing that opens you to the world. It's the part of you that flowers into the world. And that is compromised often severely through trauma. And I don't think there's anybody that doesn't have trauma, but we all carry it to different degrees and manifest it in different ways so I think this is whether whatever it is we're holding within us and we all hold histories personal histories and, and and deeper but that the erotic is that energy which is opening us which is you know the skin 
feeling the air, you know, the smallest thing, the smallest gesture can be a move towards that healing, towards that. And I don't think trauma has to be erased. I think sometimes we just have to acknowledge that it's there, that something has happened to us and keep moving. And that's really difficult. There's a, there's a lot that, I mean, this is not really the, the place to, to, to talk about this. That would need something very specific and the, uh, a specific situation, but simply that that erotic energy is what is connecting us to life and turning us towards towards some kind of reconciliation with our pasts, with what's happened. And so it doesn't have to be expressed sexually, but it's still ultimately that energy which comes through us. Unfortunately, it's also the site of so much pain and the site of so much um, violence, various kinds of violence. So it's also the place where people hurt a lot. And it's one of the reasons I think we have this huge problem now with a, a move towards disembodiment, um, a, a fleeing from the body and escaping from the body, a, a, a difficulty to stay with the pain of the body. And I think partly the erotic can allow you to stay with the pain and, and transmute that pain. This is how I, I've worked with it personally and how I see it. Um, transcending sexual experience or whatever but just simply being that that flowering into life like michael said <laughs> and about uh the the second part of nicolette's question about land just dis like displacement i've been thinking about that a lot too and in terms of ancestry and and just not directly knowing where my lineage goes to like the land from which the people who I came from you know uh lived on and and just doing a lot of research having to do first of all having to do the research in the first place is not my favorite like the reason why I have to do this research so intensely is because of reasons that I have no control over and I am in a land that uh, wasn't chosen by the people who are in my lineage. And so that is a conversation that I've been having a lot and would love to talk with you about that at, at another time too, Nicolette. But I think that some, one way that I've been looking at how to work with that for myself is walking, literally walking the land that I live on right now and establishing a connection, a familial con connection between myself and places in which I'm walking and allowing that to be a sort of mini performance with, within myself and around myself and learning about what is going on around me. I live on Muskogee land. I have, I'm, I'm learning about what that looks like, what that means. And I'm learning about potentially where uh, my people came from and trying to say, well, this is where I am now and this is how I'm going to express my erotic sense in this location. I'm taking up space with this walking and I don't give a fuck who has anything to say about that. And that's part of, I, that's part of the journey that I'm taking, but I, I really connect and resonate with the idea of displacement and how there's another layer of disembodiment in a way when that lineage is broken. So I just wanted to say I affirm and hear that question and understand. I also wanted to just say that if we're anything as humans, it's resilient and adaptable. So this energy is also the reason we are so resilient, we are so cunning, we are so adaptable, that we can overcome, that we can continually overcome where we find ourselves. And again, there's like a the, the, the double-edged sword of that. It can be both a good and bad thing. Um, but also the erotic is being in the moment. So walking where you are now is like that being present now 
is so important rather than it traumatize us so much to patterns and and histories that are buried within us but also we can just be here now talking together being together sharing sharing our stories just just connecting and i think that's i think that's really beautiful and really possibility of hope is is in this kind of engagement because if we only look back if we only weigh ourselves down with trauma we don't go into the future and the erotic is always oriented toward the future even if it's has to transmute and use the energy of the past whether that's a traumatic energy or just a deep ancestral knowing where we've come from and all the the things that we have amassed into this body knowledge that we carry with us that's all oriented towards being present together in the moment and also going forwards into you know creating a future together so we are we are resilient creatures that's something hopeful <laughs> i think i would love there's a lot of beautiful questions and i think also a lot of them got touched um via the question that just happened. And again, I'll send the chat with the replay so folks can reflect and respond if you want to. Um, but I would love everyone who's here on the panel, if you'd like to tell us where we can find more about you, more about um, your work, um, and any last thoughts you have before I wrap us up. <laughs> Everyone's okay, being quiet. On the internet, so tell us where we do that. Okay. Um, well, I feel like we just barely scratched the surface, but I also we, we um lots of threads to follow and to explore, and so many things. So, um, thank you, everyone, for being here. If you want to find more of my work, it's on alkistisdemek.com. So my name. Dot com <laughs> or scholar imprint which is the publishing side and that's um, sort of the magical books but my personal work and my essays and some performance pieces are up on alkistis.com alkistisdemek.com <laughs> that's it i don't do social media i'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to minimize <laughs> thank you <laughs> I am on anikaaustin.com and I'm in Atlanta at Emory. You can come visit me anytime. In the library. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, uh, my website is michaeljmorris.co. Um, that's the home of my um, consultation practice, uh, astrology, tarot work. Um, some of the ritual work as well, some writings, um, lots of resources, lots and lots and lots of podcasts that I've been on are archived there. If you're looking for more conversations to stimulate your thinking, your imagination, your feeling, the depth of feeling of which you're capable. Um, and then on social media, I'm on Instagram at Co Witchcraft Offering and on Twitter at Morris Michael J. And I will drop those in the chat as well. I'll be sure everyone's going to get the links in the email. If you're here, you got an email from me uh, with a link. So I'll send everyone's handles and things. Um, and I'll also make sure that it's on the YouTube replay in a nice little screen. Um, and I want to just close us up with um, a little blessing that just kind of came out spontaneously while you all were talking, because um, writing is how I pay attention and also how I think. So. I ask that we might embrace the force of the erotic in whatever way it wants to blossom through us, though it may be suppressed or repressed because it is dangerous and powerful and chaotic and it has the potential to be liberatory. And may you be liberated and may we be liberated. And in this moment when there is so much that is unknown or ambiguous or on the cusp that we may access the erotic to make the future, to make and to know and to be curious, and to find the beauty in whatever those moments and landscapes want to be, and that we may know ourselves, and that which we belong to, and that we may know one another, and that we may know life. And that is my blessing for all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And yeah, 
have a beautiful rest of your day, your evening, your afternoon, wherever in the world you are. And thank you all so much for coming and bringing your, your presence and your beautiful questions and comments and places where you are. So thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mary Grace, Alkistis, Anika. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. See you all. <laughs>